As Scott mentioned, I'll be the moderator for tonight. My name is Connie Carter. I'm with the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. I'm going to invite our panelists to come up, and then I'm going to introduce them. And while we're waiting for them to come up, I'll just put in a quick plug for the coalition. You can check us out at www.drugpolicy.ca. We're awesome. We're a national organization committed to drug policy reform. In fact, I've just written a blog about the legalization of cannabis, which I think you'll find interesting if you want to check us out. Okay, I'm going to introduce our panelists. And while uh, I'm doing that, people are going to be circulating with pieces of paper that you can write your questions on. And then they're going to bring them to the front. And uh, we'll take your questions in turn. So um, if you have something that you want to ask as a clarifying question about how heroin-assisted therapies work, please ask away. And uh, if you have anything else you want to ask, please also write that down on a piece of paper. So in the meantime, however, as it is my pleasure to in introduce the panel, as you can see, Scott is sitting at the far end. I'm going to start by introducing Dave Murray. So Mr. Dave Murray... Dave is a participant in both the Naomi and the Salome clinical trials, uh, <coughs> clinical heroin assisted trials here in Vancouver. Um, Dave is also the founder of the Naomi Patients Association, a group of former participants in the Naomi study. Now, the Naomi was the first study um, that was conducted here in Vancouver, stands for North American Opiate um, Medication Initiative. A group of former participants in the Naomi study that has now been renamed as the Salome Naomi Study Association of Patients, also known as SNAP, and includes participants from both Naomi and Salome trials. Um, Dave is a longtime volunteer with Van Du and is a board member of several organizations, including the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood Council, BC Yukon Association of Drug War Survivors, and Pivot Legal Society. Thanks for being here tonight, Dave. Sitting next to Dave is Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate has worked in, the down in Vancouver's downtown east side with patients challenged by hardcore drug addiction, mental illness, and HIV. With over 20 years of family practice and palliative care experience, and extensive knowledge of the latest findings of leading edge research, Dr. Mate, Mate often speaks and teaches on issues of compassionate health care throughout North America. He has written several best-selling books on addiction, including In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts and Close Encounters with Addiction. Thank you for being with us tonight. And last but not least on our panel is Dr. Bruce Alexander. Um, Dr. Alexander is pr Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology at, the, at Simon Fraser University. He is a noted researcher and advisor on issues of addiction and has published many academic articles on models and causes of addiction, treatment of addiction, harm reduction, and drug policy. He is the author of the book Peaceful Measures, Canada's Way Out of the War on Drugs, and the more recent The Globalization of Addiction, a study in the poverty of spirit. I think it would be fair to say that our panelists tonight are um, pioneers in their fields and, dis and very distinguished, each in their own way. So, <laughs> okay, so I want to kick things off by asking the panel a couple of questions while we're waiting on your questions. And so one of the, I think one of the places I want to start is with uh, giving each of the panelists a minute or two to talk about their responses to the film. What did they like about it? Um, and, and what critiques, if any, do they ha might have about the film? So why don't we start with you, Dave, and see where that takes us. <laughs> yeah, well, it, 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 it's different a little bit than what we have over here in, um, at Salome and Naomi was, because here, obviously, it was um, a study, and they didn't have all the, the things that they had there. So it was, quite, it was quite interesting to see what a program... A clinic looked like for me because um, the study is quite different. You know, it's uh, much more regimented and and there's less, you know, like social uh, aspects to it. Like how, like uh, the housing thing was quite interesting, and you saw them getting together for meals and and things. Um, and it seemed very small the clinic. You know, I, I think at the end it said. Uh, 
uh, what was it? There was um, six clinics with a hundred pa uh, participants in six cities in Denmark. I heard, I've read uh, afterwards that there was, um, I think it was, they were built for like 200 capacity, two or 300, I think it was. So they they hadn't hit capacity at the time the film was made. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think it would be great to have something like that here in uh, Vancouver. I think it would benefit quite a few people. <laughs> Getting out money. <laughs> I didn't notice that, but um, yeah. So you know, it would be it would be great to have something like this here in, in Vancouver. I think um, um, we're we're a community that would benefit uh, big time from uh, having clinics like that. Thanks, Dave. Dr. Matei, do you have any comments on the film? Well, two. One is it gave me a sense of personal hope because. The guy in the film who hadn't cleaned his apartment for 10 years, I'm the same way. And I thought, <laughs> maybe if I could go to one of these clinics, I would clean my room. But, but the other really is the point that the federal government absolutely misses, you know, that when they talk about recovery, um, th th they really think that there's some kind of contradiction between maintenance and uh, heroin prescription on the one hand and recovery on the other. It's as if these things are somehow in opposition to one another. And, uh, what you saw in the film, of course, was, was striking, is that people start off wanting to get blasted. And, 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 and then what they want towards the end is they want to lower their dose because they want to become more conscious. And uh, they have the uh, intention of actually making something of their lives. And so uh, what the government really doesn't get uh, here in Canada with its current policies is that their goal, and, you know, and, and I can well believe that their goal is recovery, um, is not in any way uh, uh, vitiated by an approach that involves giving people what they need when they need it. That in fact doing so will in the long term promote more recovery. And given how this recovery based uh, approach just is a complete and utter failure when it comes to uh, many, many thousands of, tens of thousands of users, it's instructive to see in this film how the very fact of giving people their heroin actually leads them to wishing to use less and to be more productive uh, in their own lives and contributing to society. So that contradiction really needs to be obliterated in people's consciousness. Thank you. Dr. Alexander, do you have any comments on the film? Oh, just one quick reminder. If you have questions, if you could just, just one thing. Could you just wave them around so the folks in the room can pick them up from you? Thank you. That's great. Well, I'm, uh, yes. I'm hoping that the film will be shown at the Conservative Party conference. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I think it's a, it's a great film, in my opinion, because I, I, I think that when they show it at the Conservative Party conference, they will realize that the, the people who are getting this kind of treatment are, are real human beings and they have all kinds of anxieties like the rest of us. And, and they'll, they'll also realize that it doesn't work for everyone, but it works for a lot of people. And they can be told that, that uh, this film just confirms really a century of knowledge. We, you know, we talk about the fact that we have studied giving heroin to addicts in the last you know, 10 or 15 years in Europe, but really we've been doing it for a century. There's all kinds of really good historical information on it, and it all points to the same conclusion, which is that there are some people who will not get along very well unless they're offered this kind of, this kind of treatment and, and that it can work out very well and often does work out very well. So I'm kind of grateful for this film. Thank you. Scott, do you have anything you'd like to add? I think, think everybody has said it all. Um, yeah, I wish Rhoda Ambrose was sitting in the room and watching it. And I, I, I'm not sure if she would change her mind on anything, but um, you know, it's interesting to contemplate. I, I think the movie is, um, I, I liked it, and, and one of the reasons we wanted to bring it was just it's a, it's a really true to life and compassionate portrayal of people that are going through, through some really difficult times, but you get to see that um, you know people are are sons and daughters and 
husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. And, um, I, and I, think, I think that's something that needs to be done. You know, we need to really remove this stigma around um, what is essentially a, a physical condition that people go through. Thank you. If I could just add one comment, which is, yes. all, which is this, that um, there's a phrase that I quote from the Egyptian novelist, Naguib Mahfouz, who, who writes that uh, nothing records the effects of a sad life as graphically as the human body. And when you look at these people in the film, the users, I mean, their, their sad lives are etched on their faces. And the one thing that addiction, the one thing that the film doesn't talk about, maybe it wasn't in its perspective to do so, and that's fair enough, but these, it's not accidental who ends, up, who ends up addicted. That's just important to acknowledge. That addiction isn't some genetic disease, and it's not a choice anybody makes. It's actually an outcome of trauma. And, and, and almost in every case, significant childhood trauma, abuse, sexual and otherwise. And you had a hint of that in the film, although the hint wasn't picked up on. When that guy in the film says that, um, who goes for therapy, and he talks about how he's ashamed of needing help. Well, that, there he's telling the story of his childhood. Because nobody's born ashamed of needing help. Infants naturally cry for help. It's when help is denied and you're made to feel bad for the very need that you have. That's when you develop that shame. And that shame actually is a survival technique. Because it keeps you from asking help from people that aren't going to give it to you. Or might even hurt you if you do require help. Or if you make your choice up as vulnerable. And so I just wish that the politicians and, 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 and actually the physicians... Uh, who deal with addiction uh, were more aware of just who they're dealing with when they're dealing with these people. Who they're dealing with is not just people who suffered because of addiction, but people who suffered in the first place, and that's why they become addicted in the second place. Any other comments on that from the panel? If not, we'll go on to a couple of questions that I just received. One of them really is a quer uh, clarifying question about how this works. Somebody in the audience has asked, what are the requirements to get into this type of program? And I was wondering if maybe, Dave, you'd like to respond to that. The, requi the requirements to get what, into What are the requirements oh, to get into I, well, HAT? Here in, here in Canada, the, um, the requirements are um, it's to get into the study where... Uh, you had to have failed at a whole bunch of treatment op uh, options like methadone and or suboxone and uh, treatment centers. You, you had to have quite a history of failure at these other uh, treatment modalities. And uh, I, th I think that it's similar in Europe, the, the, the requirements. Usually the, the, uh, the, uh, the um, programs in Europe are, are uh, medicalized kind of models, so it kind of like coming to a treatment, uh, for the treatment a couple of times a day at a certain location. Like eventually people start to, you know, get a, a, a hang of their life and get to, you know, like to see their life as it is and want to move forward. And uh, they get fed up. I, I say to people all the time, if there was a program set up in Vancouver here and it was at the corner of Abbott and Hastings, would you want to come to the corner of Abbott and Hastings two or three times a day for the rest of your life? I think, I think not. I think a lot of people would would start to move toward apps and it's just and and you know they would move forward in their lives and I think it would be positive here in Vancouver that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another person has asked a, a question about methadone and what are the negative or unintended side effects of methadone because this seems to be the criteria for most of these programs is that you have been on methadone and it hasn't worked for you in the past and so I'm wondering if anyone on the panel wants to respond to that question specifically about methadone. Well, methadone is a synthetic opiate, and um, it occupies the same molecular receptor sites on the surface of cells that other opiates might, so that it, um, uh, it means that when you take methadone, you don't have withdrawal symptoms. Uh, as any opiate, it can have uh, significant side effects, such as sedation, um, dry mouth, uh, constipation, uh, all kinds of effects throughout the body, uh, emotional problems, depression, and, uh, and so on. Um, overdose can lead to uh, somnolence and uh, obviously even death. Uh, it can uh, significantly uh, impair your functioning if you have too much of it. 
But, you know, it's like with any medication. Um, there's no medication that you can give, give that will not have potential side effects for some people. And this is the point that, again, that the government doesn't realize, is that um, Rhonda Ambrose says that methadone is a good treatment for, uh, uh, for heroin uh, use. Well, that's true some of the time. In fact, that's true a significant percentage of the time, that you can give somebody methadone. You, you haven't treated their addiction. They're still addicted. They're just addicted to something that you can take by mouth, and they're addicted to something that's legal. But it's like with any other medication. You have X number of antidepressants, but, but that there's some people with depression who simply will not respond to four different antidepressants. So you give them a fifth one. And the same with methadone. Some people just don't respond to methadone. Who knows what's different about their chemistry, what's different about their receptors. But there's something different about them, which means that when they get the methadone, it does not stop them from craving opiates. It does not stop the, um, the urgency of the opiate uh, desire. And that's a small percentage of uh, opiate addicts, but it's a significant percentage. And for those people, the methadone is simply inadequate, and then you have to give what will work. And uh, what works for them is the heroin. There are also people for whom heroin doesn't work, as a matter of fact. But in this case, we're talking about people for whom the methadone fails. It just fails. It just fails to satisfy. It fails to stop the behavior around addiction. So then they need the heroin. Well, Thank speaking, you. Speaking from experience, I've been on methadone probably at least 10 times in my life. And I've been, I think the longest time was maybe for eight or nine months. But I, I never stopped using. I mean, I kept the dose to a low dose so that I could still feel the heroin and that, uh, and I think the methadone was just an insurance so that I wouldn't be really sick. Uh, and I, so I, I mean I didn't I didn't I, it didn't work for me uh, for uh, ever. What about methadone for pain? Methadone for pain? Yeah. Well, um, in when I worked in palliative care looking after terminally ill people, sometimes when morphine didn't work, we'd bring in methadone. And so it'd be a re, it'd be a useful um, adjunct in the treatment of some kind of severe pain. However, the problem is that when somebody's been on methadone for a long time, then methadone will not work as a painkiller for them very much. So if somebody is a virgin to methadone, then you give the methadone as a powerful analgesic. But for somebody who's on methadone already, adding more methadone will not do very much for their pain relief. Indeed. Thank you. Connie, I'm, I'm wondering, can I, can I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. So I, I'd actually like to ask it uh, for Dave. I'm wondering if he would uh, describe a little bit of um, some of the benefits he experienced being on the Naomi and the Salome study and cha changes, if you would. Yeah, so, so I, I'll go really quick here because uh, I, I did the Naomi Salome. I mean, the Naomi study was in from 2005 to 2008. I think I was about uh, in the middle and I got off, I think, around 2007. I went into, uh, oh, I, I went into a two-month uh, downward spiral, right? They lost everything that I gained by being in the, the program and ended up homeless. Went to uh, try uh, detox and, um, and treatment, and uh, about three months, I kind of maintained it, slugged it out. But I went back to uh, heroin over that winter the next spring. I tried it again, went to treatment again. This time it kind of worked a lot better and I kind of like struggled for a, a good nearly three years. It was a struggle and eventually I went back to, the, the, to my addiction again. It was the, the, uh, where I found the solace and where I could, I could function, you know, where it would make me feel okay. I know it's hard to un understand for a lot of people. When we say this, a lot of people, it just made me feel all right, where I could function every day. Um, I got uh, back to my addiction again. I was, uh, I try it now. The new drug came out that was approved with Suboxone. So I, I, we went on Suboxone. I went on Suboxone. Uh, that was okay for a little while. And then I, I slipped on that too. Um, and Salome was coming up, so I, I applied, and I, I was in there. Now my one year's up, and um, they've got me on 
Now this, uh, uh, an oral uh, liquid, uh, subox, I mean, excuse me, it's not subox, oral hydromorphone, which is uh, what they call the LADA. It's a painkiller. It, it's not really maintaining me very well. Um, I use heroin now, um, again, street heroin. Um, and I don't see much of a future uh, doing this, of course. So I don't know. I, I'm, my my future is up in air right now. I, I'm really. Uh... Now it's possible that the Saloma study will show that, which is Naomi's study indicated, but didn't prove that intravenous diluted works as well as intravenous yeah. heroin. Yeah. And maybe. if it shows that, then maybe you might be a candidate for that later on, right? Yeah, maybe. But I'm saying no, the, right or, now, the oral is not really. Uh, the oral is not doing it. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, I'm grouping the questions a little bit here because there's lots of questions. And so I think um, there's, a, there's a several questions here that ask about or pick up on attention in the, itself in the film around the rightness of this approach. And I think even the staff members are struggling a little bit in the film to try to answer some of the questions that are being posed to them about this. So I'm going to actually ask you, Dr. Alexander, if you want to comment on what is, what's the struggle behind whether or not this is the right thing to do? What do you think is, is given your familiarity with the history of drug policy, what, what do you think is going on there? Well, it is indeed very interesting in the film that the, the nurses are, are actually hesitant about this, and of course they know all the pharmacology and they, they have lots of clinical experience, and, and yet they are. And I, I think the reality is that we're, you know, we are in a particular cultural position where we've, we've all been bombarded all our lives with incredible stories about certain drugs, and, and including heroin, and it's almost impossible not to take them seriously. And this, this, is, uh, this is an obstacle for any kind of rational treatment. Um, I, what I have learned, however, at, uh, from decades, actually, of, of teaching uh, pharmacology courses and addiction courses at SFU is that if you get people together in a room for a semester... And it's simply tell them the facts. I mean, it's not necessary to embroider the facts or over-dramatize the facts or anything, but just simply tell them the facts. By the end of a semester, virtually everybody understands that, you know, heroin is a drug. It's like other drugs. It's, it's like the laudan, and it's like, well, all the rest of the, the opiates. They're, they're really all in the same family. They do the same things, and, and uh, the, the, the panic disappears. But it, but it requires uh, that long. You know, it requires a, a, a lengthy exposure to, to simple, simple facts and clinical studies and, and reports of people who are not addicted have taken heroin experimentally and all this stuff. There's a huge, huge, huge body of information, which if we could only, if it were only public, we would be able to, I think, demystify and de-demonize heroin and, and, and therefore be able to, to treat it rationally. The, what is the, the encouraging part of this is that, you know, people, people will learn this in, in, a, in, a, in a few weeks. The discouraging part of it is that the demonization goes back literally a century. And that, and that the same arguments. I mean, uh, reading Rona Ambro's little little speech about about uh, Vancouver and 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 prescribing heroin uh, is kind of dismal because because that same kind of speech was being given in the 1920s, literally, mm -hmm. the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s. The the demonization of this drug is a is a very very long established thing and but it we we can get over it and I, that's why i think i'm i'm really honored to be here with the, in the uh rubric of the of the pivot legal society and and all the wonderful people in the downtown east side who over and gabor <laughs> in particular who have who have over the over the decades have have moved us quite far from the 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 levels of of extreme panic and, and just absolutely crazy demonization that we had in the 70s and 80s towards a slightly more rational approach, but we've still got a long way to go. And I, so I'm, I'm hoping we're, 
you guys are all going to keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a great job, but it won't be fast. I, I, I just like to. I wanted to add to something about what, what this, the the uh, the Danes went through to get this. They didn't have a study in Denmark. They went straight to program, and and the the most recent evidence that they had to rely on was Naomi. The evidence that came out from Naomi it was published in I think 2008. And I mean, here the Canadian government spent ten ten million dollars on Naomi, and this and they, and all the results of it, then sat on their hands and did nothing with it. Yet the Danish people benefited from it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and incidentally, if you want to go to the, what happened in Europe, the, the the Swiss actually had a referendum on heroin assisted treatment, where it was overwhelming. The population voted voted for it as a treatment program. And I think it, it, they have 23 cities in Switzerland where heroin assisted treatment is an ongoing program. Over over 1,500 uh, clients. Yeah, it's interesting that you should raise this question about. I mean, um, Dr. Alexander, you referred to it. Um, Dave, you've, refer, you've referred to the question too that there's been over eight randomized controlled trials on the success of heroin assisted treatments. And, random, and for those of you who don't know, randomized controlled trials are the sort of top of the sort of hierarchy in terms of research that's looked at as being the sort of the most legitimate. So the evidence behind this is very strong. So the medical evidence behind this is very strong. Um, and I think to some extent the people in the film make a really good case that this is also the right thing to do ethically. And so a, a number of you are asking questions that get at, if we know this, then why do we, don't we do this differently? Why don't we just make this more broadly available? And I, I, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that question, because I think that gets at something that we've been sort of skirting around a little bit, which is what's at stake here in terms of offering these kinds of treatments, and what's the, where is this resistance coming from? Well, as, as a physician, um, one always hears the phrase evidence-based practice, that, that what you do medically ought to be based on the facts and research and so on. Now, I only wish that that's how medicine was practiced. There's so many areas in which it isn't, actually. But at least the principle is paid more than lip service to. Now, one might also wish the same in politics, that there should be evidence-based politics. <laughs> C can you imagine what social policy would look like towards the environment, towards um, minorities, towards troubled families? and certainly in the realm of uh, drug policy, if there was actually evidence-based. I mean, the evidence-based, the evidence supports none of what's currently uh, po policy, and it supports a completely different approach. So when the facts on the one hand and the policy on the other are in such contradiction, you really have to ask what's going on. Mm -hmm. And what's going on here is not an intellectual argument. I mean, it's true that you will find a couple of doctors here and there who argue against uh, prescription heroin, argue against harm reduction and so on. I mean, you get ideological biases in every profession. But on the whole, on the part of the practicing physicians, you just don't get any disagreement. Um, not significantly, and not any large numbers. What we have here is the government, and all governments are that way, but this one is particularly that way. This government is particularly ideologically based. They have an ideology that I could speculate on where it stems from. Um, I rather suspect that when I look at the prime minister, I know where it comes from. That man is emotionally dead. You can see it in his eyes. He is uh, a, a traumatized person who's completely shut down against his own trauma, and he hates vulnerability because it was, he was so hurt when he was so vulnerable. He attacks vulnerability wherever he sees it. So you can say that that has an emotional base to it. More broadly, that emotional-based denial of reality shows up as an ideology, an ideology of moralism and control and judgment and um, righteousness. And they actually think that somehow they're Christians. I mean, they have no idea what Christ has anything to say about anything if they actually think that way. Um, but, but, but they base it on, 
They base it on this very uh, narrowly conceived ideological basis, and precisely because ideology is based on emotional defenses and not on facts, therefore the facts do not penetrate. So there's simply no arguing, there's no presenting facts, there's no presenting evidence, there's no research-based practice, there's nothing that in any way resembles rational discourse. And so I'm afraid that uh, one can say that, but the solution is not how to convince these people. You cannot convince these people. Uh, not because they're not decent human beings or they mean to be, but simply because they're so shut down and so defended against reality that uh, reality doesn't penetrate into the realm of their thinking. Unfortunately, they happen to run this country. And uh, that's what we've got. And uh, which also means that, uh, as I'm going to ask Scott this, I mean, you know, it, it's just so frustrating that every time there is some decent thing that you can do to help the most vulnerable and the most hurt, uh, what Dostoevsky would have called the insulted and the injured, every time there's something you can find you can do for them, the government says, no, you can't do this. And then you have to go to court just so that you can do the decent thing that science supports. What a crazy world that for the sake of sanity and science, you have to go to court every time. So my question is, are we going to court on this one? It's <laughs> a good question. Scott? Yes. <laughs> stay, stay tuned um, shortly. Okay. I think we're, we're, looking, we're looking at legal options, and I think, um, you know, definitely we can't, can't sit by and let these harmful regulations stand without challenging them. And I think, um, yeah, I think definitely. And I think it's fair to say, based on how this has taken place at the level of, the, of both federal politicians and federal Health Canada officials, that they've left, them wide, left themselves wide open if, to if I may, challenges. If I may, I'd like to pick yes. up on the, the uh, resistance question, Yes, too. please do. Because, I, you know, I, I agree with, with Gabor. I don't think anyone's going to convince Stephen Harper of, of anything, but... Um, I think that it's very important that, that the information and the case studies and the films like this get out because the change is going to come from the bottom up. This, unfortunately, is, I guess, the history of our times. The good changes are coming from the bottom up. And if we look at Vancouver over the past 50 years, we, we, have, we have seen an incredible change in the way people here think. I mean, you... Most of you are too young to know, to know what Vancouver was like in the in the 1960s and 70s, but it was a brutal place for for any kind of of drug addict. I mean, brutal in a way that that you know, we don't we don't see it anymore. And the, um, people were spending most of their lives in the in the BC Pen and Ocala and getting brutalized on the way in and while they're there and on the way out. Um, that's that's changed. It's changed a lot. The public opinion has changed significantly, not enough. And we still have the kind of the demon drug fear that, that lingers and, and is, it, makes it, makes it difficult to be rational. But, but the change in public opinion is, is so marked that, that I think that's where the hope lies. It, it, it's not a matter of convincing Stephen Harper. It's just a matter of not voting for him. And I think, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think what... I think that that will happen. Thank you. Um, I think a number of you have also are asking a set of questions that uh, speak to what would a program, so if we didn't have the kinds of ba barriers that we have right now, if we move beyond the clinical trial phase, what would a program in, say, Vancouver or uh, uh, Toronto or Montreal look like? And so I'm wondering if I could invite, perhaps starting with Dave, members of the panel to muse, muse on what kind of for starters, what kind of legal and regulatory framework would enable this sort of program to take place without the substantive barriers that we currently have? Like, what kinds of changes might we need to make this happen? Yeah, Other than, like a, you know, like you. getting like rid of Harper. Sure. Um, so, actually, it's quite, it's quite simple. Um, there's, you know, a federal approval. They, they schedule drugs in different categories. And the first, the first hurdle now is that um, heroin is not approved for any any um, use outside of a clinical study 
in Canada. And so um, the first thing is the government simply lists it as part of the pharmacopoeia that doctors can use to prescribe, and then doctors prescribe it. And so one, on one spectrum, you, you could have a program where a, a doctor prescribes heroin to an individual patient. What we've been looking at now are models uh, with this film and, and through the clinical studies are models um, of, of supervised prescription where people go to an actual physical space and receive, um, receive syringes filled with a, pre, uh, a predetermined amount of heroin or given that. And so um, the you know, what the government has done now with the regulations is they've, they've taken off the table uh, some of the mechanisms that, that we might need to import heroin into the country and get it into the hands of uh, clinical pharmacies and, and, and clinical doctors. And they've also cut off uh, access, particularly for the people exiting the Salome study to have this, special, this access through the special access program where, where they can be continued in care. Anybody else want to answer that one? Because I have another question. Um, some other people are also asking about, and I think this is a very, I think it's interesting that you've detected this from the film. Um, there's more going on in the clinic space in the film than just the prescription of heroin. Mm -hmm. So if we were to imagine a, a similar situation here in Canada, what might be the ideal setting in well, terms already, of services. I mean, we already have that just a few blocks away, really. I mean, if you go to Insight, yeah. which is designed, uh, of course, as a place where, <gasps> no thanks to the federal government, but thanks to, <laughs> th thanks to Scott and his the Pivot Legal and, and other people, um, where people bring in their drugs to, to be inject. It's not just about injecting drugs. People get coffee, people are talked with, uh, people are engaged with, People are treated like human beings, and and, uh, and and especially given that people have not been treated like human beings all their lives since their childhoods. When you are, that actually gives you a different sense of yourself. That gives you a different sense of how you can be in the world. It gives you a sense of the, a different possibility for yourself. So the model, I don't think, the mo model is very nice what we saw in Denmark, but I don't think that we have much to learn from it, except in the sense that it validates what is happening a few blocks over here in Insight. And that's simply what one of these clinics would look like, is a place where people come and are allowed to be uh, human beings, and, and where they can begin to experience some of their own human potential. Yeah. There's another, there's another treatment model which is, I think, very Canadian. Um, and it's one which I learned about in the 1970s because I was, um, in, I was working with a group of people who were fighting against the B.C. government at that point, which was trying to essentially put the methadone program out of existence or to put so many restrictions on it that it wouldn't work. And so a group of us were, were fighting back against that. And in the process of doing that, I got to meet quite a number of Vancouver doctors who wanted to talk to me and to my colleagues about their prescribing. And, and these, were, these were generally speaking family doctors, and they were in most cases prescribing morphine to heroin addicts. And you would need to know that, that um, for most, or many, most I think heroin addicts, morphine is a, is a, is a very, very good acceptable substitute. These were, these, were, these were regular doctors who had a regular practice, but some of their patients were, for whatever reason, needed to have these prescriptions, and they were doing it. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't legal, but it wasn't really illegal because, because the police and the medical association were willing to just look the other way and, and not make too not make much of a fuss about it because everybody could see that this was, was just being done for the right reason and it was, generally speaking, working out very well. I think, I think that there, you know, there's lots of room in Canada, in our, in our history, um, for, for uh, doctors having just a few patients and, and um, um, we could hope to go back to that. You know, as a doctor, I should know this, but I don't. But Dave and, uh, and Bruce, are, are you aware of any reason why heroin would be considered 
more addictive than, say, morphine or Dilaudid or some other opiate? No, sorry. You're saying more addictive? I'm asking if, if there's any reason why it should be considered that way. Like, why are we even thinking about it? I wouldn't even. Think, I wouldn't think so. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. no. I, I mean, I think you you know the pharmacology yeah. as yeah. well as yeah. as well as we all do. No, there's no reason that heroin is specifically addictive. It's a it's a symbol. It's a symbol. I mean, it's just it's another, a symbolic it's just another drug crusade. Yeah. I mean, that's the way it's symbol. Heroin stands for the devil. Yeah. And and that's that's why it's it's. Particular, that's why some people just will never ever uh, accept it because it has acquired this symbolic value, and that's what we have to get beyond. Right, Dave. I've heard you say a few times that we should stop using the word heroin and use the word <laughs> dicetylmorphine. That's, that's a tough one, but I mean that would that would yeah. that would work because it's just an, another drug from a plant. Right, and it's probably an ac just an accident in history that we're, we're sitting here today. I mean, and alcohol is not the devil, and and and, and uh, heroin is. You know, it's, I, I call it an accident in history. Somewhere along the line, I don't know, in the 1800s, when they were, we were talking about uh, you know, ointments and and potions and things, that uh, we just, uh, you know, the women movement had gone after something else. We, we might not be here today. I blame it on women. <laughs> we'll just leave that one alone. <laughs> Um, a number of you are asking uh, a set of questions that get at, I think, may, what might be some, shall we say, unexamined power relationships that are evident in the film. So I, I, I'm going to put this one to you, Dave. So if we were talking about an ideal setting in which we would offer these <coughs> kinds of treatments, um, how might, what would we want of staff who work in those kinds of settings? What, 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 what do we need to do better? <laughs> okay, I'm in a tough spot now because there's some staff in the audience here. And, no, well, I'm, I'm telling you, there's some not really... Not to besmirch the current No, no, they, this, right. the, I tell you the staff the, over across the street here at Salome, they're, re they're really dedicated people and they're really, really caring individuals and they'd love to see this this uh, eventually become a program. And there's a couple of doctors here today I see tonight from the, the clinic and, and they're, they've been, they're the heroes of this movement because they've been, they've been fighting for this for, for many years and... Uh, I think we all applaud the doctors and, and the staff here. And, and there's and nothing they'd like to see more than having this uh, uh, become a program. Um, in, in the film, you saw that how the people were reacting to this, the staff. They were loving, caring people, and they, and they wanted to, you know, make help people make people's lives better. It's, um, uh, you know, it's. <laughs> I mean, we all saw the film there, the guy who, what was it, the guy who he didn't clean his house, and there was the other one who never had a house, and, and so they were helping them get all these things together. I, I noticed in the film there was a, like a kitchen, they were having food together and all that. These are things that could be in a program. I remember mm -hmm. um, we had a guy here uh, from Sweden, and he came over once during, uh, just before the Olympics, and he described how they, they were doing the method on in Sweden, and it was this umbrella uh, kind of thing, a one-stop shop where the people would come and get their uh, uh, substitution treatment, which was, they were talking about methadone at the time, but there was, a, uh, was housing, there was, uh, there was some people there to help with um, uh, mental health problems, there was, uh, you know, it was a whole uh, bunch of things that were uh, offered, all the social services were offered under one roof, and it seemed, and it seemed to work quite well, and I thought that that might be a and I think that would be what a, a kind of program would morph into here, and I think that's what it, it's, um, it's what is happening in, in Denmark too. And you've got to remember, Denmark—that's the beginning of it. I mean, I mean, we we could look at that in a few years from now, and it might be might be even more comprehensive. Yeah, terrific, yeah. terrific. Um, I think that one person asked a question, which I think is probably something that we can just answer yes to. They asked, "Can we get this shown on television? This documentary?" I think the answer is yes, we can certainly try to do that. Um, and I, I'm assuming that that question touches a nerve in terms of like how do we let more people know about the success of these programs. Um, another set of questions that people are wondering about is um, about the question of, um, and Dave, you just touched on this very briefly and I wanted to come back to it. Thank you. Um, 
what 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 do we need here um, in terms of like it, it seems to me that the provision of prescription heroin is part of the puzzle, but it and, and as you said from the clinic itself, it sounds there are other things going on in the clinic. But a number of people are asking about what other kinds of things need to happen around that. So you just talked about the the fellow in the film who's trying to find a home um, and some other stuff. And I'm just wondering if the panel wants to comment on some of the other things that are at stake here in terms of what we need to provide. Well, the one thing that's, no, I don't know, the, that's missing from the film, and I don't, I, it's not a critique of what they're doing there, but I think what's necessary is nobody uses for uh, trivially. I mean, I don't know what happened to you in your life, Dave, but you didn't wake up one morning and said, my ambition is to become a heroin-dependent person. <laughs> Yeah. That's not how it started. And, you know, you talked about how it makes you feel. And, and let me just ask you, I mean, how does it make you feel when you take the heroin? How does it make you feel? Well, I, I, you're right, uh, Dr. Mati. I didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I want to become a heroin addict and yeah. well, give up my family, my friends, everything I ever owned, and you know, end up homeless on the, on the corner. No, it's, it's not something that... That I, I've never spoke to anyone that that's what they they seek out. It's something that oh, their life uh, experiences have led them to. This is the only thing that actually makes them being able to, myself included, to live and to to function in society somehow. So what is it that it, I don't mean to be too personal, but what is it that it gives you? What's the feeling that it gives you that allows you to to be okay? Well, I've read your book, so. <laughs> no. so I know about the warm, soft hug, I could say. <laughs> so, so, the, so, so, so really, really, it gives you peace of mind? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, yes. Peace of mind. So, uh, so in other words, what, 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 what people are after is what we all are after. Uh, the people, are the drug, the, yeah. the people are addicted to substances, they just want what everybody else wants, which is peace of mind and, and mm -hmm. connection and a whole bunch of other things. And what the film does not explore and it wasn't its purview necessarily, but the clinic doesn't seem to engage them in that kind of discussion. Is, 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 is what, I know it's the beginning, so I'm not critiquing it, yeah. but I'm saying what's also necessary. Yeah. What would also be necessary is an exploration of what that's all about for people. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't have peace of mind, how come you don't have it? If you don't have a sense of connection, what happened? And what else can we help you bring into your life that would give you that peace of mind, that would give you that sense of connection so that you're not f relying completely on the drug to do it for you. Mm. So that conversation was missing from the film. And, and, and in any center that's, that's established around substance use, I'd like to see that in there, of, of helping people identify what they get from the use, what led them there, and how they can gain those qualities in their lives without the drugs or in addition to the drugs so that they're not relying only on the drugs. And I think that's what would help people gradually let go of it. So that exploration, I think, is... And unfortunately, uh, and this is the, just a sad fact, is that physicians are not trained to think that way. So that it's entirely possible for somebody to see addiction physicians for decades and never be asked what happened to them in their lives. It's astonishing, but that's just how it is. And even nurses and so on. I mean, the nurses that gravitate to working in the downtown east side are a very particular group. Mm -hmm. And so are the physicians very often. But by and large, in the healthcare professions, there's not that awareness of how people's life experiences lead them to um, certain behavior so that there's very little in the training of healthcare professionals that helps people explore and maybe get past, let go of those emotional patterns and all that. So that needs... What I'm saying is people need a lot of compassionate support, counseling, and a lot of listening to. They need to be listened to a lot. And whether they do that at the center or not, but it, it just wasn't evident that that's one of their, one of their goals. Yeah, I would yes, want please. to pick up on that and, and go a step farther, even to say that it's really important here that we uh, bear in mind the, the limits of professional service. I mean, we can, we can have the kind of professional service that, that Gabor is describing there, and that'll be great. But what we really need, of course, is for people who, who are in a, such a center to be able to go out into the street, into a welcoming community, into a society that they can trust, into a, a world which is, which is stable and, and uh, 
makes sense. And we, there's, a, there's a limit, even to harm reduction and even to, even to heroin-assisted treatment. There's a limit to, to what can be done because the, the kind of addiction that we, we talk about here, this heroin addiction, is, of course, simply the tip of a much larger iceberg of, of addiction which is, which is all of our problems, and it's a problem which is a societal problem rather than an individual problem. And, and I just think it's important to say this, that, that whereas we, you know, we're all here because we have great hopes for high harm reduction and for heroin-assisted treatment in this case, and, and me too, but, but it's never going to be enough. We have to look at the larger problem, and we're only going to do that when we get past kind of the the Rona Ambrose um, approach to thinking about drugs and, and, and just thinking about them in a, in a, in a more level-headed way. And just why is it that we are an addicted society? That, that problem is next on the agenda, I think, once we take care of the little problem of the war on drugs. Thank you. That's a, I'm aware that we're running out of time, but that's a perfect segue into our last question, which is a number of people asked about the legal context of all of this. And I think the question that they're asking is, what role does prohibition play in, in, of drugs play in contributing to the situation that we find ourselves in right now in terms of whether it's barriers to access to HAT or anything else? Well, I, I know mean, it's a doozy. Any, sorry. Any number. <laughs> Bruce can answer this beautifully because, uh, you know, his... his um, his book on the subject is still a classic, you know, and, uh, and I'm sure Scott has something to say. The only thing I'll add to it medically is that if you look at the literature on stress, what is it that stresses people? What stresses people is loss of control, uncertainty, lack of information, and conflict. This is what stresses people, and, and exclusion and isolation. These are the stressors. These are the stressors that trigger the body's stress response mechanism. So you get high stress hormone levels. Now when you get high stress hormone levels, one of the ways to soothe them is through addictive behaviors. So whether you do this to laboratory animals or whether you do it to human beings, when their stress hormone level goes up, they want to be using something to soothe themselves. So those of you that might have an eating problem, for example, when you're most likely to go home and binge eat is when you're stressed. So this is the literature on stress. Okay, great. So imagine now a group of geniuses in Ottawa or Washington thinking about how do we tackle the problem of drugs? Oh, they say. Well, we know from the research literature that the most significant trigger for addictive relapse is stress. And we also know that the most significant triggers for stress is isolation, conflict, uncertainty, loss of control, uncertainty. I know, let's exclude these people. Let's make their lives totally uncertain. Let's engage them in all kinds of conflict. Let's ostracize them. That will surely get them to give up their drugs. <laughs> in other words, the war on drugs, if you had to design a system that is going to keep a lot of people addicted and, and entrench them in their addictions and make it difficult for them to leave it behind, you would design exactly the system that we have right now. It's really that simple. Thank you. Um, Dave, I, I think we're done for tonight, but I, I think on that happy note, since you live at ground zero of this one, I'd like to give you the last word. Oh, gee, no, please. <laughs> I'll pass it to Scott. I'm going to give my last word after you Oh, okay. You take, you take the second last word, though. Oh, no, so, I, so I, I'm, I'm sitting here and hoping that, that uh, well, that Rona Ambrose, it would be nice if she was here, but um, she was here about a week ago, and she said something about, they asked her if she was a uh, visit insight, but she said she had a plane to catch. She said maybe the next time she comes. Um, I think the next, we should find out the next time she comes and we should all go down there and tell her exactly what we want here. We want the, the government to start listening to, the, to science and stuff and end and, and this ideology, this crazy ideology that they have and we'll, get, we'll move right on there. I think we have to listen to the stories and the stories of the people, I, listen, I hear them every day. I, I formed a group of patients association so the patients could have a, a voice of their own the Salome Naomi Association of Patients, and we meet every Saturday up at Vandu, 
And I think that it's important that we ha we be able to tell our stories and our stories get out there. And uh, we'd like the, the government to listen to them, but I don't think that that's quite quite on the agenda yet. But I think the, a lot of the people, I think a lot of what moved it forward in, in Denmark, the, the place we just watched on, on the film there, um, uh, was them telling stories of the people that were excluded in their society in Denmark, and the people looked at it and said, that, no, we can't do that. There's a little film on, on YouTube. It's called Waiting for a Legal Shot. You can just ask for that. And it's about six minutes, uh, Waiting for a Legal Shot. And it tells the story of how they got it, the program in Denmark with, without going to a study. And they, tell the story, they told the story of, of a, a, a girl, a woman who was excluded from society and she was, a, she was selling sex and uh, how she was, um, uh, she found that she took methadone and a bunch of uh, benzos. She was, it was kind of like heroin, but the benzos were given to her by this old, a 71-year-old uh, guy who was uh, like a necro necrophiliac and he'd wait till she had given her so many of them she'd just be right out of it. Anyway, this story went on the news in in, uh, in Denmark, and they, they show uh, frontal nudity and stuff like this in Denmark. It's quite common, and, and they showed this in the 6 o'clock news. Well, the next day, the phones were ringing off the hook in the, in the parliament uh, telling them, you do something about this, you know, and, that, and, that's what, and that's what moved it forward in Denmark. I don't think, I don't know if we have to go to that here, but that's... Uh, uh, that that was what started in the, the thing in Denmark. It's a, an interesting little film. It's only six minutes. Waiting for a legal shot. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you to our panelists. I think we're going to turn it over to Scott for the final word for tonight. And thank you to all of you for your brilliant questions. And over to you, Scott. Nice questions. Okay, well, um, I hope you've enjoyed the film and our panel discussion. And so I have a couple thank yous I'd like to extend. Um, so the first one is to Am Joel and the SFU's Vance City Office of Community Engagement for providing the space and facilitating uh, these great public forums. We've done, um, I think this is the fourth one we've done here, and we're looking forward to doing uh, more in the future on social justice issues. Um, we'd also like to thank the Danish Broadcasting Company for providing us with the film to show. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that suggestion to get it on uh, TV in Canada somewhere and see if we can, if we can have that done. Uh, I'd like to thank Van Du. Um, Dr. Susan Boyd and SNAP, uh, the Salome Naomi Association of Patient Members for their continued advocacy around heroin assisted treatment in this community. And of course, we're very appreciative of the volunteers who have helped out with tonight's event. And we'd especially like to thank our panel, uh, Dave Murray, Dr. Bruce Alexander, Dr. Gabor Mate, and our moderator, Connie Carter. So I'm gonna do a plug for um, a upcoming event. Uh, in this very space, November 6th, Joe Sacco, the, um, the comic uh, illustrator. It's 7 to 9 p.m., and it's moderated by Charlie Smith, the Georgia Strait, and tickets are $20, sfuwoodwards.ca. So um, with some luck and maybe um, some interesting words and skills, you're now motivated to take action to support evidence-based treatment over ideology. If that's the case, then I encourage you to not let tonight be the end of your engagement on this important issue. In the back of the booklet we handed out when you walked in, um, there are some steps listed that you can take to support a HAP program in Canada. And you may have also noticed uh, that we had an insert in your booklet about uh, Pivot's upcoming annual event, Passion for Justice. Um, and that's going to be at the Ironworks studio on November 14th. If you'd like to learn more about Pivot's work advocating on behalf of marginalized communities and have an amazing and fun night in the process, come to Passion for Justice. Through the wonder of modern technology, uh, about 10 minutes ago, I sent you an email uh, right now that's going to have a link to uh, the website where you can get tickets or you can find out uh, some information on this insert or you can read it right there. So, in the recent throne speech, um, the federal government threw down the gauntlet on each of uh, Pivot's campaign areas. They refused to take meaningful action on housing and homelessness. 
They refuse to acknowledge the injuries and harm that police dogs inflict, and they want to make dogs heroes instead of the weapons that they actually are in practice. They vowed to continue to criminalize vulnerable sex workers instead of protecting them, and they declared a war on science, evidence, public health, and common sense by denying heroin-assisted treatment and supervised injection services to people who use drugs who need these medical services. Pivot will continue to fight through strategic litigation and law reform to counter policies and laws that lack compassion, going against evidence, and infringe constitutional and human rights. With your help, we will win that fight. Thank you.